Thank you all so much for having us here this evening. Um, you can hear me, yes? Okay, wonderful. Um, yes, thank you. So my name is Jackie Aguilar. Um, Natural Womanhood is a nonprofit organization uh, located in San Antonio, Texas, or based from there. We, our main goal is to educate women and couples about natural methods as an alternative uh, for family planning and, and the potential harmful effects of contraception. So we do this through our online, our website, naturalwomenhood.org. It's just a wealth of information. There's over 700 articles, uh, podcasts, videos, uh, in several different languages. So you can definitely use that as a resource. Um, our, our mission is just to, to, that we believe that every woman can learn to claim her natural fertility as beautiful, powerful, and healthy. i to make sure that this is on because I'm known to be fairly soft-spoken, so if you can't hear me, please let me know. My name is Erin Dewey, um, and yes, I also work for Natural Womanhood, um, and today we're excited to be here to talk to college students because I actually just graduated from the great Texas a and University. Woo! <laughs> uh, yeah, Jeff is also an Aggie, um, so we love our Aggies. But I really love talking to college students because that's kind of when it all started for me. That's when I started learning about how my cycle worked. Um, that's when I also was getting really frustrated with doctors telling me, here's the pill. And I was like, come on, there's got to be something else in women's health that there's a solution other than the pill. Um, and so that kind of piqued my interest and I started to think like, okay, well, I you know, I know I have cycle issues, but you know, there's gotta be something other than the pill. And um, that's when I found about, out about natural women. And I um, had the opportunity to lead some clubs called the Cycle Mindfulness Clubs, which we'll talk more about later. And we'll kind of start to understand more of what we're talking about through the process of the presentations. Um, but I think one of the biggest things that I learned in the clubs um, was one that understanding and knowledge like gives us the opportunity to have freedom, like greater freedom, because we're, we understand that we have a choice and we can choose the good, and we can choose what's healthy for ourselves. And also that there's no more fear. There's no more fear of, oh, I don't know how my body's working. Oh, like I must just be a crazy person and then my period comes and I'm like, oh. Um, but I actually understand like, this is what process is happening throughout my body every single cycle. Um, and I can be informed about that and I can get help, real help, which we will talk about in our presentation today, um, other options besides birth control. Um, so just really glad to be here today and excited to dive deeper with this topic with you guys. And then I guess from the maybe relationship perspective, right, because we're also going to talk about complementarity and how this knowledge can um, make an impact on you know, the relationships between men and women. When, it, I've been married for 17 years now, I have five kids, my oldest has just gotten driver's license, it's pretty exciting. But we, at the beginning of our marriage, did not have this information, right? So what I had been taught in my health classes growing up in high school and things was, um, you know, you can get pregnant anytime you have sex, and so the way that to be responsible about this is to use some form of birth control, right? So a month before I got married, I went and got a prescription just for my primary care for birth control because I thought, okay, I don't know exactly how many kids we want and when we want to have them or whatever, so for now I'm just gonna do this. And from, like, and I can't, like, so my husband was in the Army, right, he's the Corps at A&M, and then he went to the Army, and so, you know, he used to be in his little uniform, and just, I mean, super cute, you all should see him. And, um, and so, so much desire. So much attraction, you know, that, that, that we had when we were dating and engaged. Like it was very difficult for I, I felt to you know practice chastity and to be um, in a way of, of, of trying to re you know respect those boundaries that we should not respect before we get married. So we were so looking forward to like yeah, there was such hope for this like awesome intimacy we we're gonna have in marriage. And I started taking the pill, and it was like this little light switch went off, and all of a sudden. By the time I got to my wedding day and my honeymoon, like I felt like awkward. I had no desire, and and intimacy was very awkward. So I just lost my libido completely, and I couldn't understand like why am I 
attracted to my husband anymore. You know, I know that I used to be before. Now that we can do all these things, I have no desire to. I'm so confused. So it was a really difficult time for us. And it wasn't until several months later that we said, you know what, now let's just, let's just try and have a baby. And we, I stopped taking it, and boom, like a light switch again. All of that attraction and desire returned, and our intimacy improved, our communication improved. And, and so we were like, okay, after the baby, we can't go back to doing what we were doing before. Like, what do we do now? And thank, you know, thank goodness we had several, you know, just a medical professional and some friends that like, led us to this knowledge that we, we were totally ignorant of. And I thought, wow, I can't believe there was this huge bit of education that I was lacking that affected my life in such a dramatic way to where I was like contemplating divorce or something. I was so unhappy and I didn't know why. So hopefully this will kind of also delve into that, you know, complementarity and how, it's, how we're meant to work together, but not um, by being at war with our body or not by mutilating our body in any way, but by like working with the, the, the natural design of it, which really leads to the most optimal outcomes for individuals and also for relationships. So, okay, speaking of this complementarity, right? Um, what does it take, well, what do we need to, you know, for reproduction, what do we need for a baby? Egg and sperm, right? It says, they've always taught me these two components, right? Um, but in fact, there's a, a third component to this equation that we don't always consider. So, um, that, if you wanna just go click over. Uh, so, yes, we do need good sperm, and we do need, you know, a healthy ovum and egg, um, but there's a third component, um, cervical fluid or cervical mucus, right, that's produced inside the woman's body that is the medium that keeps the sperm alive inside of a woman's body, right? And um, because it, it needs that, that, that medium in order to be able to um, travel all the way up to the fallopian tubes where conception occurs. No cervical mucus, no baby, right? You're, you're missing a key component. So we're going to talk a lot about cervical mucus tonight, right? Okay? Because um, while men, right, um, are always fertile, right, from, from the moment they hit puberty, somewhere around 13, 14, to basically the rest of their lives, right? You know, Tuesday morning, Sunday night, always fertile, right? <laughs> um, women, for the most part, are infertile, right? Women cycle from between phases of fertility and infertility, um, and and that, that fertile window is just a set amount of days each cycle. There is this opportunity for conception to occur. Um, does anybody know um, how long, like, so ovulation is that process of releasing the egg, right, from the ovary. From the moment it's released, how long does the egg live? How long does it have a window to be uh, fertilized before it disintegrates? What was it? Just a guess, any guess? 24 hours. 24 hours, very good, yes. Okay, and it's, it, and it's actually closer to 12 hours, and then it slowly starts to disintegrate. Right, so it's a very narrow amount of time to, for conception to occur. But that window of opportunity is actually um, expanded by this fertile cervical mucus because sperm, okay, so another very important thing for us to understand is, um, I'm just talking about some anatomy, um, the, the vagina is a very acidic environment, right? It's an opening to the body, so it needs to be able to, to pr protect the woman from pathogens and germs and things like that. So it does that by remaining very acidic, right? So sperm placed in that environment will die within minutes, right? It won't last very long at all. But when cervical mucus is present, it neutralizes that environment and provides that, that nutrients that the sperm needs to then travel all the way into the body and for conception to occur, right? So some of these things that, that are key for our knowledge and understanding how our bodies work. Um, we, we, we don't always learn earlier in our life. So just so that, so uh, again, you know, since since um, if, if we think about this in the sense of a if a woman is the one that cycles from infertility to fertility, right? Then then a couple's fertility would be based on the, where the woman is in her fertile cycle, right? Whether she's fertile or not, not because men what always fertile, right? So the, the variable is where the woman is in her cycle as to whether a couple can actually conceive or not, whether a couple is fertile or not. So we're going to focus a lot more on women tonight, right? Um, the, the key that I want everyone to, to pull from this is that inside the ovary, right, women have two ovaries on either side of our uterus, right? That's where all the little immature eggs are held, right? Um, we, we, we're born with all the eggs we're ever going to have. We actually 
Um, a, a baby girl fetus has all the eggs inside of her ovaries already when she's inside her mom's tummy. So if you think about it, half of you was inside of your grandma, right? When your mom was inside of her. Um, so hundreds of thousands of little immature eggs, right? By the time we get to puberty, we only have about 400,000 left. They age with us, right? Men, men the sperm memory, whatever many days, I don't remember what that is. But women, we're, our eggs age with us. Like, you know, right now I have like 40-something year old eggs. It's very sad. <laughs> but, um, so, but there's a cyclic event happening every single month, every single cycle inside of the ovary. Every, uh, every the beginning of every cycle, um, several eggs are chosen to mature towards ovulation. While that egg is maturing, it's producing estrogen, right? Estrogen is very important for women. After ovulation, um, ovulation is again that release of the egg, the material that was a follicle, where the egg was maturing inside of this liquid sac called a follicle, that material remains and becomes this temporary endocrine um, organ called uh, the corpus luteum, this little structure, and the corpus luteum produces progesterone, right? So the first half of the cycle, we have estrogen. After ovulation, we have progesterone, and that comes from the, from the ovaries, okay? Um, the other important thing to know, so we all recognize that this is the uterus, right, um, inside of a woman's body with the fallopian tubes that reach out to either side towards the ovaries. At the base of the uterus is this really important uh, organ called the cervix. There was a, a Swedish doctor, Dr. Oldebach, he described it as a biological valve. Sometimes it's open, sometimes it's closed, depending on where, you know, the, the hormones that are causing that change. When the estrogen is high, the cervix is open, and it causes the cervix to produce fertile cervical mucus, right? And this can be observed by a woman on the outside of her body, right? So she can know, based on the sign that her body gives her, where she is in relation to ovulation, right? So that's, hence, cervical mucus. Okay, so, next, the way she's talking about cervical mucus, the way that this could be observed on a quote-unquote chart, or um, just by going through your menstrual cycle. Uh, we like to divide it up into two main phases, so the pre-ovulatory phase and the post-ovulatory phase. So you'll notice it's all kind of surrounded around ovulation, and that's because ovulation really is the important event. We've been told all our lives that it's your period because that's the most obvious quote-unquote biomarker, but really it's this ovulation and the cervical mucus that builds up to allowing the ovulation to so that being said, everyone I think knows that day one of your cycle is the first day of your period. So it's, it's the most obvious way to really track it. So that's why we started on day one. So you'll see that menstruation, it's normal for it to last about three to five days. And then the green here is going to mark some kind of dryness. So if you think about what the hormones are doing at this time, um, during menstruation, both estrogen and progesterone are low. As you're getting off of your period, you're gonna, you might have some kind of dryness like that for a few days as the hormones are still a little bit low, but then estrogen's gonna start rising. And with the, under the in influence of estrogen, you're gonna start to see mucus. And so these yellow stamps right here are marking mucus. So what's important about that is this is really gonna give us insight into your fertility. So what you'll typically see is mucus that maybe starts off as cloudy or pasty or not a whole bunch. Um, and then it progressively gets more watery or stretchy or slippery. Um, and so that's going to be the really fertile mucus. Because if you're thinking about it in terms of con conception, like Jackie was saying, that's going to help the sperm swim. Whereas that pasty mucus that you might have observed prior um, that's that's gonna uh, that's gonna keep the sperm stuck and not allowed to swim. So okay, then you have ovulation. You get that stretchy, slippery cervical mucus. Yeah, you ovulate it, or or maybe you don't, and you have a prolonged first phase or pre-ovulatory phase. And um, sometimes when that happens, it can just be due to stress. Um, and there's a lot of different. Um, stresses in our lives, maybe you'll have finals coming up, or um, just any kind of
kind of stuff, it is even really good stress, even something really good happening in your life, a really intense emotion or things like that, that can cause um, a delay in your ovulation. So then after you ovulate, there's usually a return to that um, maybe basic uh, infertile pattern, you might call it, of dryness. And so what's happening there is estrogen is now coming down and progesterone is taking over. So as progesterone is becoming dominant, it's drying you up. So you are no longer fertile. Um, and if you were to have sex during these days, you would not get pregnant very likely. Okay, so we probably talked a lot about cervical mucus and you want us to stop talking. <laughs> uh, but the reality is, okay, why is this important? It's important because our cycles and our brain, our fertility, our entire endocrine system is all integrated. They're not just one separate part, it's all integrated. So that being said, I know a lot of us here, sorry men, you probably haven't experienced this, but women, you know what I'm talking about, like you, you feel like you're crying easily, you feel irritable, you're bloated, all these different things, and then all of a sudden your period comes and you're like, oh, it makes sense. <laughs> um, and so we, we don't deny that there is, there is a relationship there, but a lot of times we chalk it up to it's just my hormones and we're like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. Um, but actually, the really cool thing that I learned when I started working with Natural Womanhood in, in the Cycle Mindfulness Clubs was that you can know what to expect for every part of your cycle, not just like, Oh, I bet my period's about to start because I feel like crap. <laughs> you, can, you can know beyond that, and you can also be able to um, kind of relate that to the physiological things that are happening under the surface. Um, so, for instance, one day you might feel like, yeah, I can do this. Like, I'm going to go take two exams, and I'm going to go run six miles, and I'm getting my life together. Like, I feel great, and I've made a lot of progress. I'm so proud of myself. And then five days later, you're like, I can't do it. <laughs> I'm, I'm tired, I'm irritable, and I just want to sleep, and I don't want to talk to anyone. Um, I know that's a lot of times what I would experience, and I would get frustrated with myself, because I was like, why can't I just like, be the same person all the time? I feel like I'm so inconsistent. And then I realized, um, learning research, uh, seeing research on this topic, I realized that that wasn't even possible by our biology. It's not possible to feel the same every day because, and you'll see it in a minute, this hormonal symphony that's going on and that affects our emotions because it's all connected within the endocrine system. So, you know, you might be thinking, okay, well, like, can you tell me, like, maybe a little hack so I know what's going on in my, <laughs> in my brain. Um, so the research shows that as estrogen is increasing, as you're going towards ovulation, you know, you're coming off your period, you're going towards ovulation, um, you're going to have, you're going to be more motiv motivated, you're going to feel like being more productive, you're going to feel like going out with friends and being social and connecting with people and having pictures taken of yourself and things like that. So you're going to feel good, you're going to feel confident, you're going to want to go do hard things. And then as your fertile window comes and goes and progesterone, progesterone takes over, you might feel more like being alone or reading books or um, I find that I play a lot during this time, um, organize my room, do things like that. Um, but when, like Jackie was saying at the beginning, like the sooner that we embrace the reality that we live in as women and how our bodies function and take that um, just be on the physical level and realize that it affects every aspect of our lives, the better. Because that's where I think our true power um, is because we understand and it's a very powerful tool. So here's a little comparison. We thought that you never looked a very good graphic for this. And uh, we kind of started laughing about this one. It would probably be more accurate to say that that's like a man's day, like every single day of the month. And those are like a woman's uh, emotions throughout an entire month because they're always fluctuating. But it's so funny. <laughs> uh, okay, so men's hormone levels. 
they are that top part with the testosterone. So the way the men's testosterone works is that it's highest in the morning when they wake up, they're ready to go, they're ready to get stuff done, be productive, and as the day goes by, their testosterone levels are slowly dropping. And then by the end of the night, they're ready to go to bed. Um, and then it starts all over again. So like Jackie said, it's Tuesday night and Sunday morning. They're fertile because that's staying consistent and they're producing sperm. So, but with women, however, we were talking earlier about how estrogen rises, there's ovulation, it comes back down, progesterone takes over, hormones are low at the beginning of the period. This is the explanation for why you're always changing your emotions and your feelings. You're not a different person. This is just the physiology behind it. Um, so we thought it would be good to have a, a comparison up there so that, you know, women you can understand yourselves, but also men that you can understand what is going on um, with the women in your life, whether it's a girlfriend or a friend or a sister, whoever it might be. So a lot of the science that's been done behind the effects that our um, body chemistry has on physiological changes. So um, this, is, this is a study that was published about the changes that the physiological changes that happen to a woman's appearance during the time of ovulation. Like our collagen production actually increases, our lips are a slighter shade, brighter of red or pink, our eyes are imperceptibly larger. So um, you know, when they ask people to um, categorize like the attractiveness of different pictures of the same woman, that the picture taken of the woman while she was ovulating was more most often the one that was chosen as the most attractive. Um, so these subtle changes, it's funny, I mean, like, like why do we wear lipstick? We're like imitating what naturally happens during ovulation, right? Crazy. So it also affects our pheromones, right? Those, those scents that our body produce that are kind of like a sixth sense, like we don't consciously know we're smelling them, but they do influence our decisions and the way we think. So there was a study done where they had um, women like smell like the shirts that men have went and worn, you know, they, they sort of kind of smell their body odor. And the women that were naturally cycling were able to identify men who were genetically different from them, which meant, you know, meaning that they would make a good uh, partner for reproduction, right? Because of the, the, the more different your, your DNA is from someone else, the more compatible you are, right? For, um, that's why you don't marry brothers, right? Anyway. So, um, so the women that were using old hormonal contraception had difficulty identifying men that would make good genetic suitable partners for them um, because their chemistry had been altered and so, so did their sense of pheromones, which is very interesting. Um, and then and it also shows that they also like have done tests where they put men um, in close proximity with women that are around the time of ovulation where their estrogen levels are high and it actually causes their testosterone to temporarily rise, right? And they also have uh, other situations like, you know, walking to a room for a guns or walking into a, a athletic, you know, a big, a big football game or something. Like there's a natural spike in testosterone that's like, you know, um, is isn't that normal just pattern, but it, it's like a, it's a little, it's a little spike. And so testosterone likes estrogen. So it, it's interesting, like ladies in, you know, around ovulation, if men just randomly out and open the door for you or something, you know, it's because of these pheromones that are actually influencing the way we behave. Um, and, and it's interesting, it's important to know, right, you know, um, and, you know and we, when we talk to younger girls, we talk to them about how, you know, do, you know during this fertile time, or during this time of heightened estrogen, um, it's like putting on uh, fertility goggles, right? They have a different perception of the world, so, you know, all of a sudden that boy in class looks really cute, and whatever, and you're thinking all these thoughts, you know, and then, you know, a week later, when estrogen drops and the fertility goggles come off, you're like, oh, wait, that door put the acne, like, what was I thinking, right? <laughs> But it's because our, our perceptions are, are altered by that chemistry. Um, so this is why Erin was referring to the hormonal symphony. So a woman in a state of health is, is a fertile woman. It's a woman who is capable of, con of becoming pregnant, of conceiving, right? Um, this is the natural function of our body. There are so many intricate details that go into the that, to making a woman capable of achieving a pregnancy. Um, that it's something that if we truly understood the intricacy of it, it was something that we want to protect and, 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 and care for and, and maintain because it is a delicate balance. And if one of these variables is off, it would be difficult for a woman to conceive. So the, the, the line of the talk, you've seen that already, those milk hormones from the ovaries, 
Um, the ovulatory cycle, what's happening inside the ovary. The, so, if anything, if you have a, a weak corpus luteum, it's not producing enough progesterone, right? That could be a risk for miscarriage. If the lining of the uterus is not building up sufficiently in response to estrogen, that could be a risk for you know, infertility. All these different factors, and if, if, if the cervix isn't opening and closing as it should, um, so it's, it's amazing the amount of, you know, the, the, the response from the brain that the hormones the brain sends down to release the egg. All of these things have to be in a delicate balance of, of synchronization in order for a woman to, to be in a state of health in order to be able to conceive. So it's really amazing. So when we talk about um, fertility awareness, specifically as, as a method, as, as charting, for, for young women, it's, it's just a, a matter of every single day observing these biomarkers. Um, the most common is cervical mucus. A lot of people will use basal body temperature, resting temperature. Um, some people use um, urinary hormones, um, so meaning uh, certain times of your cycle, um, you know, t testing with a test strip um, for the hormone levels in, in your morning urine. Um, so that there's all kinds of different things, biomarkers that you can use to identify where you are in your cycle. Um, and then recording that information on either on paper or in an app, um, so you know where you are. Um, my husband and I used to do this the old-fashioned way. Like, he would stick a thermometer in my mouth every single morning because it's your resting body temperature right after you've slept for seven or eight hours and you get that, that neutral resting body temperature and you record that, that way it's consistent every day. And um, so I asked him to sleep and he'd stick it in my mouth. And, uh, and then he recorded it, and, you know, he's an engineer, so he'd look at the little line chart and see how I was doing and, and tell me where I was. He'd remind me when I was going to start my period because he'd see my temperature drop back down and, um, and say, no, I'm going to take care of your pads. He's, he's, he's great. He's so supportive. Um, and, uh, but, uh, but, but nowadays, like, they have so much bem tech, it's just advanced so much. My daughter, she wears um, the, the temp drop bracelet. And so, um, anyway, great, this is armband, you know, so you just sleep with it, and it, like, syncs your temperature to your phone, to the app, like, automatically. You shouldn't have to do anything, you know? And she actually, because she started wearing it, like, during puberty, before she started her first period, she saw her first ovulation and her first spike of temperature, and she saw it stay up, and then she saw it drop, and she caught her very first period like that. It was so cool. So she was my little, um, I don't know, test kid. <laughs> So these are some of those uh, tools that, that we just described in, in the cycle mindfulness clubs, these college clubs that we have. We give them just a very simple paper chart that they like to use it kind of like as a journal to log in um, their cycle and maybe the, the, the emotional and physical symptoms that go along with different times of their cycle. And or, or you recommend like a map um, that they can download. It's free and it's customizable. So these are just some tools that women can use to start observing their body in a very basic way and, and learning how unique they are, whether you're in the story of your cycle or So, oh, yeah, this is great. So we love to share this story because this was actually the U.S. women's soccer team in 2019 when they won the World Cup. Um, yeah, and there's a great quote in here. So basically what happened was um, the coach for the U.S. women's soccer team um, decided to have the players track their cycles and to tailor their uh, nutrient intake, their sleep, their recovery, all these different things with the specific phase of their cycle that they were in um, to optimize their nutrition and make sure they were um, getting enough to fuel their bodies and to perform at their highest level. Um, and we really love to share this example because this isn't just for the U.S. women's soccer team, this is for you. And you can feel more in control of your life, more um, more able to take care of yourself um, and in a very feminine way. There's a lot of research, but I want to share this quote with you. The fact is, female athletes are biologically, hormonally, and physically different. And the sooner that reality is embraced instead of resisted, the more potential exists for that athlete to optimize her training behaviors. The women of the U.S. women's soccer team are the latest reminder that women are capable of so much not to emulate men, but because our unique powerful, unique and powerful bodies are triumphs in themselves. I was like, wow. <laughs> Screaming from the rooftops. Um, but so just moving forward, you saw a normal cycle that Jackie just showed you, and here's a comparison. So the main thing to note here is, well, one, the fertile window is very short, so that's, there's 
not enough fertile cervical mucus there. And even if even if the the couple did conceive in that short, very short window, um, the luteal phase or the second half of the phase, the post-ovulatory phase, is um, too short. We want it to be um, up to 16 days, really, um, to be able to you know uh, support an embryo if it is conceived, because we know that sometimes implantation takes. Um, six to ten days and so if the couple conceives and then um, the woman is already um, is already having her period um, there was not enough um, uterine tissue endometrium there to hold the embryo can we talk okay so like yeah in that, that last example just if, if a woman sees what is normal then something changes like, I, I have countless stories just from you know, living in this world of teaching women how to understand their cycles and having other friends that also instruct and have clients and um, of women who, you know, just something slight change on their chart. So they went into the doctor and they found an ovarian tumor or they found the very early stages of cervical cancer. And the doctor will ask them, like, how did you know to come in? You had zero symptoms. And they said, well, I chart my cycle and I saw something change and I didn't know exactly what that was about. So I knew it was concerned to come in. Um, other ways, that because it, so there are medical professionals now that are using these scientific methods um, of women's charts because you're basically recording your endocrine, endocrine system, your endocrine function, right, your thyroid function, things like that. So doctors can use that data of what you're recording about these biomarkers about your body to diagnose a lot of different things, whether that's hormonal imbalance, um, you know, cancer, um, infertility issues can be resolved. This is a wonderful. Um, alternative to artificial reproductive technologies. Um, and the reason for that is because um, the, the doctor's able to get to the root cause of the infertility, right? because infertility is not a disease, it's a symptom. It's a symptom of some inflammation or some pathology that the woman is suffering, right? And so IVF th does nothing to cure the woman. It kind of forces the pregnancy in, and yes, the couple may get a baby, but the woman is still suffering from whatever pathology she had in the first place. These methods, will um, help the doctor to find the root cause, to diagnose what's actually causing the infertility, heal the woman so that she can then conceive naturally. So not only does the couple get a baby, and they actually have higher rates of success at couples achieving pregnancy, um, but then the woman is healed. The woman feels better, right, on the, on the back end. So it's a win-win, right? So lots of benefits, um, medical, medically-wise, to chart a woman charting her cycle, and, and then also for a couple, you know, because um, then together they're able to um, maybe achieve their family planning goals or things like that. So in, in today's health system, um, majority of the times, if a woman suffers any reproductive um, abnormality, any cycle dysfunction, um, the, the typical solution is you know, symptom management, which is birth control, right? That hormonal contraception um, is symptom management. It'll, it'll help the symptoms to be alleviated. The woman typically will feel better um, but however, she's not being cured, right? It's just masking the symptoms and whatever underlying cause is there is still there potentially getting worse under the guise of just that symptom management of the birth control pill, right? Um, so what true restorative reproductive medicine is, is these doctors that are trained in these methods that will not necessarily prescribe birth control, they will go um, do the investigative work to understand what is actually happening in the woman's body and find holistic solutions to healing her. Um, and this tends to have better outcomes for women because they are healed, they, um, they feel better, and, uh, and they have less um, negative out outcomes of, you know, down the line because they're able to maintain healthy health at an early age and, um, and then maintain that health through their life. Um, so FEM, sorry, just uh, FEM has their own trained doctors, or they, they do telehealth, so you can always set up a comment on their own website. And then there's natural technology doctors, natural procreative doctors. You guys are lucky here in Houston, we actually have five natural doctors. Like in San Antonio, we have one, right? Um, some cities have zero. So there's, there's a whole practice out Sugarland, and then Dr. Kilgers um, is, I think, somewhere in the medical center. Um, so all those resources are on our website. You can always go check that out if you ever feel the need. Um, and then the last point we wanted to mention, just as far as this complementarity, is how these methods, when used in the, in the context of a, of a marriage or in a committed relationship, 
how much they do to improve intimacy and, and communication in that marriage. And you think, well, like, why? Why, why, why would that be so? And if you, and if you think about it, in you know, conventional methods of, of family planning, like right, birth control, put the burden of fertility all on who? Us, right? The woman, right? And so, so now we are, we have altered our chemistry, our body makeup, in order to be sexually available at any time without any consequence, right? Um, when, um, versus in these methods, the burden of fertility is now shared by both parties, right? Both have to interpret the information and decide what to do, right? And, and so the husband is, is a partner in and shares the responsibility of that, right? So then the woman feels more respected, right, and loved because she's not um, being asked to suffer, you know, health, unhealthy side effects in order for them to have sex without consequences. And, um, and then that, that in turn, if a woman feels level, then she's going to to reciprocate that and give that right back. And then it does foster communication in the sense that um, I, I had a client once who she came to me after she got her IUD removed because she wanted, now she needs another form of family plan, um, and she didn't like the way she felt on the IUD. Um, and she was already in her mid-30s, late 30s, and she said, you know, I actually wanted to have a, a big family, I wanted to have kids and things, but time just kept passing by and passing by, and it wasn't even an issue. Like, that whole part of our relationship was just completely turned off. It wasn't even an option. So we just didn't even talk about it. And now looking back, there are so many hopes and dreams that I did not get to realize because we never even talked about it. You know, and she had like all kinds of regret in her voice, and I really, I felt for her. Um, because when you use these natural methods, you see your fertility come and go with every cycle. And every cycle, you have to decide together as a couple. You know, your husband has to check in with you. Hey, how are you feeling? You know, do you think we're ready for another child? Like, am I helping you enough with the kids? Are you overwhelmed? Do you feel stressed? You know, hey, honey, how's your job going? You know, how do you, I mean, how's our financial status? Are we in a state where we can grow our family? Can we not? You know, what are our hopes and dreams? What, what's our five-year plan? All those conversations you have to have more often because you have to be intentional with your choices towards each other. You know, and it's a totally different dynamic than if you just completely shut off that stuff part of your, family, your relationship and, 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 and your intimacy does suffer. It's hard. It's not easy, you know, um, because it requires um, self-mastery, right? And, you know, who wants to, you know, sacrifice to have self-control? But something that, that fosters virtue, right? We look at older couples, right? Because there, there's, there's another research that's been published um, by the School of Nursing at, at Creighton University that talks about how if there's a 2% divorce rate um, with couples that use these natural methods. Um, and it's because even, even later on down the road, right, when you're older, maybe you're not necessarily interested in family planning, but, you know, sometimes there's, you know, disease that, that, that maybe might come to one partner or the other, and, and one has to become a caretaker, and things like that. And the amount of self-sacrifice and self-mastery and self-control that it requires to love somebody in that self-giving way, you have been practicing that every single cycle by making a sacrifice of your desires out of love for your partner over and over again every single month. And so now you have built up that self-mastery and you have the capability to love your partner maybe as you should. So that's kind of how it impacts relationships and that complementarity between the couple. Um, yeah. So I've been mentioning throughout the talk just the cycle mindfulness clubs and one that I got to lead last year. This is it right here. Um, but if you are interested in learning more about the clubs, um, the leadership applications are going to open this coming January. They're not open to apply yet, but you can go and look at our website by just Googling. You can just Google Cycle Mindfulness Clubs, and it should be the first result there. You can click the link, read all about it. But basically, to give you a quick summary of it, we would meet every week. Uh, it was about 12 of us. Um, and we would go through a curriculum given by Natural Womanhood, Jackie helped create the Cycle Mindfulness Clubs. Um, and it was really just a place where women were allowed to share their experiences with their cycles and grow with one another and learning what it really meant, what it really means to be a woman. Um, and so we met for about eight months going through a curriculum and it was a really awesome opportunity for me because it just created a really authentic women's community. And we, we started to, by the end of it, develop lingo. 
um, to describe how we were feeling based on our cycle phase <laughs> because we all just knew um, we had grown and, and learned all that information together. But if it's something that you would be interested in, again, you can just Google cycle mindfulness clubs and it should be the first thing you hear. Or you can talk to Jackie and I afterwards. Um, if you wouldn't want to be a, a leader necessarily, but you would be interested in being a member and um, receiving all this uh, education, we are going to have a survey at this last slide, slide, and you can put in your email and things like that, and we can reach out to you. So we went a little over our time, but we have a, a little bit of time for questions. Are there any questions that any group said anything you'd like to ask? Right, yeah, it, 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 there's just a, a natural energy surge that comes during that time uh, around ovulation. Um, so yeah, if you want to do the really hard hit workouts or you want to try and um, you know beat your last race time, things like that, that would be a good time to choose to like go to that next level. Um, whereas, yeah, your body is naturally slowing down and decreasing at that time. So doing light stretching, doing the lower, lower impact type workouts would probably be uh, more optimal at that time, you know, of your cycle. So, and there's all kinds of books on cycle syncing. It's all the science. So, and you can definitely look more into that. There's articles on our website. Just to add to that too, part of the reason for that is yes, the estrogen, but it's also testosterone. You get a spike in testosterone around ovulation. So, uh, people will say like they can lift or squat like the heaviest that they can around their fertile window, and if they try that again before they're about to start their period, they can't do it. But then next cycle, it comes around and they do it at that same time again, they can still do it. But if you don't know that information, you can think, oh my gosh, I'm regressing. I'm regressing. I don't, you know, I'm, I'm not succeeding as much in my workout routine. But yeah, so that's also part of it. Yeah, so. um, could you tell us of some studies uh, that compare this menstrual? Um, charting and planning to the pill and the patch and um, the usefulness in preventing pregnancy? Sure. Um, there, there are several studies that, that, that are published and, and actually Natural Womanhood just submitted a petition to the CDC because um, they had old information so they had uh, natural methods in the same category as like spermicides and condoms like with a 27% you know, failure rate of, uh, at, at preventing pregnancy. Um, so we, we presented them with some of the latest uh, research and studies that have been done through the Creighton model and through the symptothermal model um, that show 98% effectiveness. And so the CDC has actually updated their information. Now, if you go to their website, they'll say they didn't take out the old info, but they, they added in the new one. So now it says 2 to 27% failure rate. So they included the new information that do show these methods are 98% effective, you know, um, like typical use, right? I mean, obviously, like, you know, perfect use, you could get up to 100% you know, use, but. In, in real life, you know, in practical use, it's somewhere between 96 and 98 percent effectiveness rate at avoiding pregnancy, which is comparable with you know artificial hormonal contraception. Can you talk about how like nutrition plays a role in like the That's actually something I've been doing a lot of research um, into recently. Uh, there, I do want to plug one article that was really insightful for me um, on the Natural Womanhood website. You can just type in um, cycle syncing and it'll say like something about hacks to um, cycle sync your, your life to your cycle. But um, there was another article that I read that was saying like you actually need more calories after ovulation in like the last part of your cycle before you start your period, which we know that's like when we get cravings and stuff. Um, but actually there's a reason for that because if you think about it, your body doesn't yet know if an embryo has implanted and if you've like, conceived and you're pregnant now. So what it does is it kind of tells you like, let's start eating more just in case a baby, I've conceived a baby. Um, to start being able to give baby nutrients.
implants in the case that it did implant. So typically, they'll say like, you might be less hungry, have less of an appetite during the first part of your cycle, like as you're getting off your period um, towards ovulation because you know, you're know you wanting to go out and do things and just be active and see and connect. But then um, after ovulation, the second half of your cycle, you're kind of more mellow and um, you're, you actually do want to eat more. And there is research that's saying you do need more calories. And, and and that's usually the link, sorry, I know that you even asked this, but I just had to check that came to mind. The link between like weight gain and birth control, it's not necessarily that birth control causes you to weight gain to gain weight, but it puts you in this pseudo post-peak phase where your progesterone stays high the whole time, right? And progesterone gives you those cravings of wanting to eat more. So it's not so much that the birth control is causing you to gain weight, but that you're getting the cravings to want to eat more, and, and so as a result, you do, and, and, and you never progress to another pre-peak phase where your estrogen is high because if it prevents you from progressing there, you just stay on a constant progesterone high so that you never progress towards a normal relation. That's how it you know, prevents pregnancy. But so then this comment to gain a lot of weight because you're getting all Wanting to to complete things or finish things or like you know resolve things. So um, so in those ways, yeah, like the things that maybe would require you to be more introspective and, and reflective on your life, you can do a lot of that type of planning and, and kind of constant reflecting during that time when you you have that um, desire to be more inside yourself than out of the world. Yeah, and to add the the article that I mentioned on cycle thinking, it talks about that. And it kind of, it breaks actually the cycle into four different phases, and it describes your strengths in each phase. So, um, like during your period, you're actually more intuitive. You're the most intuitive that you'll be. Um, and then you'll be more creative as you're going towards ovulation. And then um, after ovulation and your um, post-ovulatory phase, yeah, you'll be more introspective. You'll also be really good at finishing getting things done. Um, but just like a personal example, um, sometimes when we have to like write talks for work or things like that, I'll, I'll actually like plan writing it um, like after my period as I'm approaching population because I know that that's when my estrogen is going to be working for me and I'm going to feel better at communicating. Um, but then when I'm in my post ovulatory phase, I'll do a lot of stuff like in the home, like organizing you know, when you have a clean space, you feel a lot more put together. Um, but obviously, sometimes like there are so there are a lot of circumstances in life where you can't plan some things, and you know, um, I think uh, it's important to not to not think that you can't do something just because you're at a different point of your cycle. Rather, just you might be more innately um, good at this particular thing at this point. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I'm curious, you touched on this a little bit, but how do hormonal changes kind of like affect your libido throughout your cycle in more like a long-term relationship? Sure, what so, is that? I mean, what's well, considered normal or? Yeah, it, I mean, we, maybe it sometimes have we a well report feeling like um, a rising libido at different times of their cycle, but it, it is very common, very simple to feel that heightened sexual desire, like around, yeah, you know, with estrogen rising, there's also a spike in testosterone, right? So there's, a lot of that, um, you know, flirtatiousness and, and kind of like um, just just confidence in your step that comes with that, you know, that, that natural rise in, in um, you know, in that, that heightened awareness of, of, of being in a relationship and things like that. So um, that's usually, you know, the time when you feel like being most intimate, but that's also the time when you can conceive a child, right? So uh, I do remember, I mean, I think we shared the story a lot. We talked to marriage about couples and things. And, my, uh, when we were you know, younger, we were still, we, we, had, we already had a baby at home, but we knew we weren't ready for another one, so you know, we knew that I was around the time of ovulation. So I was like, I was wanting to be intimate with my husband, and I was, but I knew I couldn't, and, 
So I was inventing to my husband, I was like, oh, this is so frustrating. Like, I, I want to so bad, but I can't. And, and, and so I, I was just whining. And, you know, and his response to me, like, he just very casually was like, welcome to my world. <laughs> I felt that way. That I was like, I felt that way every day of my life since I was 13. And I was like, oh my gosh, how do you live like this? I'm like, kill myself. Like, 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 but, but at the same time, it made me like respect the um, the amount of like self sacrifice that he makes out of love for my well being. Like, like, okay, it's not a good time for me to be pregnant, so you know, like, he he restrains himself out of love for me and for the better women for our family. Um, and, and wow, what a gift of love that is to, towards me. And so then, you know, when that time of, um, you know, fertility passes, it's like almost like this honeymoon that we get to go on again because we had to wait, but now we don't have to anymore. And so, like, it, it makes you cherish those moments that much more. It makes you want, um, I don't know, I feel like, like I want to reciprocate that love to, to, to my husband even that much more because he has shown me that love, and, you know, like in turn, I guess. I don't know that's one way. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah, pretty much. Okay. Just to add to that, there was um, a story I heard one time where this guy said that charting, he, his wife's cycle actually saved their marriage because um, he thought that his wife didn't love him past ovulation, but he didn't understand that it was just her hormones. Like, she would be like, She'd be like, you know, having that desire and seemingly on the same page as him, like mimicking that same desire. And then she ovulated and then she was like not interested anymore. She was just like stressed or tired or whatever. Um, and he would take it personal. Like, why don't you want me? Like, you know, like I thought we were like on the same page and then you just like completely turned into a different person. And anyway, so he talks about how then they learned about charting their cycles and they learned that I was completely normal for a woman, um, and talked about how like it's it was it's been a way for him to realize that like it's not a rejection of himself; it's just the woman's hormones. Um, but also that he could love her um, by not trying to be intimate and force it if she wasn't feeling good, but also that she could love him by um, being intimate with him even if she didn't like feel like it or anything. Well, I, I, I guess also to that aspect, or I don't know, not, not that, like, because I guess look, the couple can't just rely purely on hormones to get everything going, right, in the bedroom. Like, the thing is, after, I'm sorry, I, I don't want to get too fast, I know we've got to stop our questions, but the thing, like, if those hormones aren't there necessarily, that's where, like, like this is an acronym spice, but, like, you know, the, the spiritual, the intellectual, the communicative, the creative, the emotional, that's where those other aspects of a healthy relationship come in. And where the man has to pursue the woman. He has to woo her. He has to romance her. Right? Because there isn't just that those natural hormones surging that are gonna get her to be like wanting to be intimate. You know, he has to pursue her in order to kind of win her affection in that way. And so that, that kind of keeps that excitement, I think, in a relationship alive. Um, whereas if it's assumed that she's available twenty four seven every single day, then it's not really special anymore. Because if you can't say no then what is your yes mean, you know? So, anyway. Um, and, oh, and can I make one more just kind of broad comment? Because I, I do think that, um, since, I mean, since we are here in the capacity of representing the Catholic students, that, you know, that, and we all, I don't know how familiar you are with the theology or the teachings of the Catholic Church that, you know, say, oh, you know, contraception is immoral, right? And, and I, I wanted to just kind of explain that because I think that gets a bad rap. I think that's it. oh, you know, like the church is just so out of clue or out of this understand the you know, situations of, of, of women and couples. But if we think about it, you know, the, 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 there's two purposes to, to sex, right? And then there's two ends to it. One is, you know, bonding or pleasure, right, between a couple, right? And the other one is obviously procreation, right? It's the only human action, right, like that can cause reproduction, right? You can't go high five somebody and make a baby, right? You have to do this one specific act, right, in order to have a baby. Right? So that's its end, that's its purpose, right? Well, let's, if, if we remove one of those purposes, you know, through the use of hormonal contraception or us in any other kind of contraceptive means, what's, what's left in the, in, in the sexual act? What, what, what's the only purpose left now? Is that pleasure, right? Then what does that make your partner but your means to pleasure? So now you are an object for someone's pleasure, 
right? And, and you're no longer reverenced as the type of person that is capable of carrying the life inside of you. So, that, I mean, so what the church, I think, has a problem with is women being objectified in that way, being seen as just an object of someone's pleasure, void of the full, holistic meaning of her body, right? And, um, and so I think, like, you know, that that's important to, to say, is that that's just really what you know, the underpinning of that teaching is. Thank you all very much.